Good evening, it's Dr. Max Lincoln um, again, and I uh, wanted to thank everybody uh, for tuning in. And uh, we, uh, we had a talk last week um, on Thursday, and uh, fortunately we did have a few technical uh, issues with that. Um, but uh, since then, we've had a number of good questions um, regarding hip and knee replacement, and I wanted to go through those and, and answer them. And I uh, wanted to point out at the end of the talk, there will be an opportunity um, through our poll. If, if you do want to arrange uh, an appointment, um, then please stick around for the poll at the end and you can, you know, we can certainly contact you if that's your, your wish. So what we're gonna do here is, um, uh, Audrey, who's with me here today is gonna read the questions and I'm gonna go through the answers and we can just kind of go, go through the list here, so. Um, take it from there. So the question, what do you feel is a good recovery time after a hip replacement? And uh, nowadays, the way we're doing hip replacements, um, we do avoid any damage to the, the tendons and we it does allow for an early uh, recovery. Um, what is typical um, would be, you know, initially after surgery, of course, uh, Patients will walk with a walker for a short period of time. And some of that is how fit the patient is before the operation. Um, patients who, you know, especially we, we spend time doing preha prehab, which is a, a chance to do physical therapy before the operation. And that allows for more rapid recovery. Uh, with that, uh, getting back to the question, I would say I would expect to use a walker for a few days and then use a cane. Um, typically by anywhere from, um, you know, one week to three weeks, I see patients uh, weaning off the, pain, off the cane and then uh, being able to walk without, uh, without any gait aids. Um, the physical therapy part, um, you know, uh, really ends when the patient is walking very well, when the muscles are strong and, and in some cases uh, doing particular activities that patients want to do. So in most cases, that is uh, four to six weeks. Almost all of the hip replacements that are used in North America um, for, for osteoarthritis tend to be what we call press fit uh, implants, um, you know, and, and they are made from titanium um, and the titanium can be treated in different ways. Um, that part goes into the femur. Now, sometimes if there is, um, if the bone density is more of an issue then a traditional cemented technique can be used um, on the, on the femur side, and we tend to use uh, cobalt and chrome metal when we do that. Um, we know that the best bearing surface is with a ceramic ball, um, and we use that on a, um, a well-engineered piece of plastic called uh, polyethylene. Um, the, on the socket side, it's always uh, titanium, uh, very, you know, in, in North America, very rarely uh, uh, do, we, do we use any cement on the socket side. So a question regarding um, in the ideal exercises to be done after hip replacements and with, uh, you know, particularly uh, weight training and, and yoga exercises. Um, initially, the, the, the idea with, with uh, any surgery is that we want the patient to recover quickly, but uh, we want to avoid any short-term um, complications of that procedure. Um, and you know, after hip replacement in particular, what we what we want to do is avoid any really provocative positions where we really uh, push the envelope a lot on the limitations of the uh, the, the um, stability of that joint replacement. And so, for a period of time, um, it, it, you know, it makes sense to avoid going into uh, hyperflex position of the hip. And, and in real life, that can be patients avoiding. Uh, going into low squats, uh, going into low chairs, and so on. And uh, some of the positions in aerobics, uh, you know, can certainly uh, challenge that initially. And I and the period of time I think uh, is reasonable for that is anywhere from uh, two to three months. We see scar tissue build up around that joint to where at that point, uh, as long as the surgeon is is happy, that probably we can do a little bit more in terms of the range of motion. Um, and in terms of weight training, it would really be, you know, if you're, if you're doing squats, it would be avoiding going too low with those squats and 
avoiding going uh, too far forward with, with uh, lunges and other things just during that initial period of two to three months uh, post-operatively as the uh, body heals internally. Um, so that's, um, that's a question um, that it's, it's one really one of uh, surgeon preference. Um, now, um, occasionally I have done, I, I like to do a, an operation on one hip. And I, uh, the big thing is when we do elective operation, uh, we want to have the patient sail through the second operation and so on. Um, my, in my practice, what I'll do is I'll do one operation on one day. And then if the patient wants them done in rapid succession like that, on occasion, I'll do one the next day. Um, and I like to see the blood work and make sure that's all in good order um, before we do the, the second one. Uh, we don't want to have the, you know, of course, if you do uh, more than one operation, you always lose a small amount of blood during surgery. And you don't want to put a patient in a situation where they may need transfusion or something like that. Um, for some patients, it makes more sense to allow a little bit more time, uh, sometimes a few months to really get the full strength, just depending on the patient's um, underlying medical condition and general fitness though. So I have had some experience replacing hip replacements that date back to the 1970s. I'll say generally, you know, most uh, revision hip replacements we do are not uh, of that era. Um, but, you know, certainly um, over time, um, you know, some of the um, parts um, can, can cause some wear and, and some, uh, bone, um, some bone thinning. And so you have certainly we, you know, in patients, um, we certainly get a CAT scan to look at that. And we have to, you know, most times we end up redoing the parts. Uh, occasionally, you know, an implant will be well fixed, even though it is from, from long ago. So we, we need to get the, uh, the operative records if possible and certainly to, to determine uh, what those parts are before we do a surgery like that. But uh, certainly it can be successful. And, uh, and you know, it, it, is, it is done. It's just I don't see too many where they relate, you know, they date back to the 1970s. I would say that there, um, there are very few studies that talk about osteoporosis um, as a result of cortisone injections in the joint. We know certainly that oral steroids cause that risk and IV steroids certainly cause that risk. Um, I don't know of any papers that comment uh, on a direct risk of osteoporosis related to joint injections. Uh, there are some studies um, saying that for a period of time that um, uh, the injections in the joint may affect the cartilage. Uh, and I've seen a few studies on that, um, but not on um, the bone themselves. Yeah, a question regarding leg lengths after hip replacement. And uh, I would say that probably the easiest thing you can do when doing a hip replacement is, you know, if you want to lengthen a, a person's limb, you know, within certain parameters, uh, it is pretty readily achievable. Um, you know, we don't want to put too much tension on the leg, though, because the nerves want to be at a certain length. And, you know, studies show after you lengthen the leg by more than uh, two and a half centimeters or an inch that uh, you know, we worry there could be too much stretch on the nerve. Um, so I would say within those parameters, uh, it certainly is relatively easy to, to lengthen a limb after hip replacement. So a question about uh, having surgery um, after weight loss uh, procedures. Um, certainly gastric bypass uh, can be helpful in lowering the weight overall, but uh, there are certain changes. Uh, we know that during the first year, um, patients may actually be slightly malnourished where the protein levels in their body may be low. And uh, second is that uh, absorption of vitamin D may be compromised and therefore the bone uh, may be more uh, osteoporotic. Um, and so my approach is to identify before surgery um, and I actually do this for all of my patients anyway, but we look at the protein levels. We try to identify uh, what we call malnourishment when those protein levels are low. And if they are low, we, we treat them before we uh, uh, go to surgery and make sure they're in a normal range 
so that wound healing will be normal after the procedure. Um, and secondly, with if there is osteoporosis, the technique uh, where I do uh, for hip and knee replacement changes, I tend to use bone cement more often than the press fit technique to lower the risk of uh, fracture. So the cysts behind the knee um, are, are called uh, Baker cyst is, is the term. They're really a cyst that can uh, push into the back of the knee around the calf muscle or gastroc muscle, and they can be a big source of pain. Um, during um, total knee replacement, they do get decompressed and they very rarely ever return. Um, but um, you know, I would expect in, in most cases, they, they would not recur after uh, knee replacement. Visco supplementation, um, you can think of it almost as an analogy to uh, oil in an engine, and I use that analogy a lot. And what they are, uh, or, or what it is, is an attempt to reconstitute the normal joint fluid. Um, all of our joints have a fluid called synovial fluid, and that fluid has molecules in it called hyaluronic acid, which play a role in cushioning uh, the joint uh, and nourishing the cartilage. And in an arthritic knee, that uh, joint fluid does change and doesn't have the same mechanical properties. Uh, and so by doing the visco injection, the uh, point is to try to restore that normal joint fluid into the arthritic knee to relieve pain and improve function. After either hip or knee surgery, um, you know, my concern would be the patient needs to have appropriate balance um, to you know, to stop the motorcycle and to be able to rely on, on that. And um, again, it relates to how strong or how, how fit somebody is before surgery. Uh, generally around uh, six to eight weeks, you know, would be a standard answer, although there may be uh, differences uh, for different patients um, to be able to control a motorcycle like that. The bone spurs are a normal part of osteoarthritis in the hip and knee, and they often form around the joint. And they're sort of a pathologic or, or diseased way the body is responding to the wear and tear in the cartilage. And they're really extra bone that forms at the edge of the joint. Um, during both hip and knee uh, replacement surgery, we remove those because um, they, they place um, abnormal tension on the ligaments. And oftentimes, they can interfere with motion or cause uh, impingement. So in, in both cases, we remove any um, uh, osteophytes or bone spurs during those procedures. Allergies um, to orthopedic hardware are very controversial. Um, and uh, some, some surgeons don't, don't believe in them at all. Um, you know, from the literature, I would say uh, legitimate allergies and, and usually to nickel uh, or to acrylamides, which are in the bone cement, the nickel would be in the metal part of the, the knee replacement, um, that they are quite rare. And I would say they'd be on the order of one in, one in 10,000 patients or more uh, would have a legitimate allergy to that where they would, you know, uh, require the need for removing the hardware and changing them. Um, so, I, so, you know, they, they are quite rare and uh, there are tests for that, although the tests aren't very clinically helpful, I would say. Um, some insurances cover robotic procedures and some do not. And uh, it's up to the, the individual surgeon how they uh, choose to deal with that issue. Which hospitals do you perform your surgeries at? I perform surgeries at the um, Ascension hospitals, which include uh, St. Vincent's Clay County and the St. Vincent's Riverside Hospital. I also perform surgery at the Orange Park Medical Center and at the First Coast Orthopedic Center, which is a surgery center I'm part of. Percentage wise, I would say my, my inpatient uh, to outpatient mix currently is, a, is approximately close to 50-50. And um, the choice of who to have the surgery inpatient really relates to their underlying health and also relates to their insurance. Um, the surgery, the way I do the surgery doesn't change for any given patient. 
Um, and I, I think if, I, if, if more patients uh, were, were amenable to outpatient surgery, I think it can work very, very well.